The atomic mechanism during a phase transformation is important because we can use the information to calculate how the structure evolves as a function of many variables, for example, the chemical composition, the cooling conditions, and the presence of intragranular heterogeneous nucleation sites. Now, this talk is quite short, uh, but there is much more information in the books illustrated here, uh, the bainite in steels and also steels. Uh, this one you can download freely from my website. Uh, very simply, acicular ferrite involves the formation of ferrite plates on many equivalent planes rather than as parallel sets of plates. Now, what is the advantage of having this complicated structure where the plates are pointing in many different orientations? Well, uh, many years ago, uh, there was some nice work done which showed that what matters in terms of cleavage fracture is that the cleavage cracks propagate uniformly across crystallographically homogeneous regions like these. And these regions, although they have very similar orientations within, also contain microstructure which doesn't deflect cleavage cracks. So it's the crystallographic grain size rather than the grain size measured, for example, using an optical microscope that determines cleavage cracking. Here I'm illustrating this uh, with the help of a fractured meteorite where you can see that the crack is deflected on each occasion that it encounters a different orientation of the ferrite plate here and sometimes even stopped. So parallel plates are not good for toughness because a crack can propagate undeviated across the packet whereas individual plates which are differently oriented can frequently deflect a crack and therefore give us a microstructure which is good for toughness. Uh, this is an illustration of uh, acicular ferrite in a typical well deposit which has been designed nicely to generate this microstructure with the help of nucleation inside the austenite grains on non-metallic inclusions like this. Okay, So these plates of acicular ferrite do not arise unless we have these non-metallic inclusions in the structure. Now notice that uh, not all plates appear to contain these inclusions. So what's going on? Inclusions are essential to generate the acicular ferrite structure, but here we can see that a large majority of plates do not actually have inclusions. Why is that? There is actually a very simple reason that, uh, you know, if you take account of the size of a acicular ferrite plate, typically 10 micrometers in length and one micrometer thick, and an inclusion typically should not have a size much greater than 0 0.2 micrometers because you don't want the inclusions themselves to act as cleavage fracture nucleation sites. Then from stereology, you can show that the mean linear intercept is four times the radius of the inclusion over six times the thickness of the plate. So the probability of observing an inclusion in a plate is really quite small, 0 0.13. So even if the plate contains an inclusion, when you look at a two-dimensional section of the microstructure, you may not see the inclusion. Okay, uh, so we have seen that heterogeneous nucleation intragranular nucleation on non-metallic inclusions uh, generates our acicular ferrite microstructure whereas if we only get nucleation from the austenite grain surfaces then the plates tend to form in parallel formations where there isn't much of a difference in crystallographic orientation. So here for example is uh, this kind of a structure where the plates are shooting off in parallel formations from the austenite grain boundary in contrast, this is the acicular ferrite structure where nucleation happens on 
non-metallic particles present inside the austenite grain, and this is a more desirable microstructure. But what are the inclusions that are important? Well, this is a very long story, and I'm going to only present it very briefly. Uh, you can do experiments very simply by putting a, a test non-metallic material here between two steel samples uh, and uh, then heat treating this in a thermomechanical simulator. And if the non-metallic material is effective in nucleating the uh, acicular ferrite, then you will see lots of transformation near this boundary, uh, near this junction between the two bits of steel. And similarly here, titanium dioxide and titanium oxide. And you can go through this process with many different test powders and reach a conclusion about what is uh, important in nucleating a circular ferrite and what is the mechanism by which it nucleates. For example, Ti2O3 actually absorbs manganese from the steel and therefore, uh, here you can see the manganese concentration profile next to the junction between the two bits of steel. And therefore, it stimulates the formation of ferrite. But the mechanisms uh, can be different. For example, it can be something to do with crystallographic matching or due to stresses arising when you cool the sample because the expansion coefficient of the inclusion is different from that of the matrix. Here you can see that titanium nitride is not at all effective in enhancing nucleation at the interface between the titanium nitride and the steel. Now, in practice, during welding, you will get a whole variety of inclusions forming because welding is essentially uh, a dirty process where some oxygen gets in and reacts with, for example, aluminium inside your material and so on. But many experiments suggest that these inclusions are effective and these are not particularly effective in uh, chemical reaction between the inclusion and the steel. Uh, and there are other mechanisms which may be active. For example, I've already said that Ti2O3 will absorb manganese from the steel and therefore stimulate ferrite formation. And these inclusions are not effective in stimulating acicular ferrite. And here are some other mechanisms by which they do the work of intragranular nucleation. As I said to you, there is much more detail in the two books that I mentioned in the first slide. Now, the austenite grain size uh, competes with intragranular nucleation. So the finer the austenite grain size, the less of a chance you have of obtaining a circular ferrite, even though you know you have non-metallic inclusions. And that's because nucleation at an austenite grain boundary is much easier than nucleation on a non-metallic inclusion. So if you increase the austenite grain size, then the chances of obtaining a circular ferrite also increase dramatically. And you can see uh, that when we do calculations of uh, acicular ferrite formation as a function of the austenite grain size. So here it is only 25 micrometers and here it's 150 micrometers. Then you see that the amount of acicular ferrite here, intragranular nucleated ferrite, is much greater when the austenite grain size is large. Uh, and this is simply the ferrite which forms at the austenite grain boundaries. So we can calculate the effect of austenite grain size on intragranular nucleation of ferrite. Here you see this is this, a well metal which has been austenitized at 950 degrees centigrade for just 10 minutes so that there is a small austenite grain size. And you can see that the plates forming from the austenite grain boundary are essentially parallel and in the same crystallographic orientation. If I take the same material, okay, and that's in spite of the non-metallic inclusions present, if I take the same material and austenitize it at a higher temperature to generate a bigger grain size, then there is an opportunity 
to nucleate plates on uh, the non-metallic inclusions and therefore we recover uh, an acyclified microstructure. So remember that nucleation on inclusions is always less effective than nucleation on the austenite grain boundaries and therefore you should aim for a large austenite grain size in order to generate the acyclified microstructure. Now, in terms of atomic mechanisms, uh, it's very simple to determine whether the transformation is displacive or diffusional. Okay. And if it is displacive, then you do not get any change in chemical composition. Okay. Here you can see that the red atoms are in the same arrangement as in the parent structure. And there is a major consequence that because we have changed the pattern in which the atoms are arranged without any diffusion, you also get a shape change as illustrated here. So this is a large shear deformation and also a volume change normal to the interface plane. And that has the consequence that our transformation product will be in the form of thin plates because that minimizes the strain energy. So, you know, imagine this shape change happening in a in your material and the crystal has to push against other crystals and that causes a lot of strain. If I polish a sample completely flat and then allow it to transform into a circular ferrite then I get a shape deformation of the surface which when you examine very closely is like this okay a shear parallel to the habit plane and a volume change normal to the habit plane. The magnitude of the shear is very large, it's of the order of 0 0.26. So if you compare that with a typical elastic strain, uh, which is only 0 0.001, then it's a very large shear deformation. And that's why a circular ferrite forms as thin plates. Now, another consequence of the shape deformation, because, you know, the acicular ferrite transformation is not just a change in crystal structure but also a physical deformation that you can see with your own eyes. Another consequence is that if you transform your material under the influence of a stress then only those plates which tend to relieve that stress by their deformation will form. So this is stress-free transformation where you can see the acicular ferrite pointing in many different directions and here we have transformed under the influence of a stress and you can see that the plates are highly aligned roughly at 45 degrees. It won't be exactly at 45 degrees for various reasons uh, because those are the planes on which you get the maximum shear stress. Okay? So the influence of stress is to make a, a more or less random microstructure into one that is aligned. The role of carbon is important. Here I have the free energy curves of ferrite and of austenite at a particular temperature T1. And in order to find the equilibrium compositions of the austenite and ferrite, we draw a common tangent. And the locus of the contact points here define the equilibrium phase boundaries, the A1 and the A3 phase boundaries. <clears throat> That's how phase diagrams are calculated. But there is an additional point here where ferrite and austenite of the same composition have the same free energy. And the locus of these points as a function of temperature give us what's known as the T0 phase boundary. And the importance of this boundary is that austenite of composition exceeding the T0 curve cannot transform into ferrite of the same composition because there's an increase in free energy. But if the composition of the austenite is less than T0, then it can transform into ferrite of the same composition uh, <clears throat> with a reduction in free energy. That means the transformation can happen in this region, but not in this region of the phase diagram. Now, let's assume that the acicular ferrite never inherits uh, more carbon than equilibrium, okay? In other words, it's almost free of carbon concentration. 
then uh, at our average carbon concentration x bar we will get a plate of ferrite forming uh, partitioning carbon into the austenite and the reaction can continue until the carbon concentration of the austenite reaches the equilibrium phase boundary here. So we get a large amount of these uh, plates of ferrite uh, because we have an almost equilibrium composition. Now contrast that with a mechanism in which the acicular ferrite forms without any diffusion at all but shortly afterwards it partitions carbon. So for For example, here, uh, the plate of acicular ferrite forms um, without any diffusion. It's the same composition as the alloy. And that transformation can only continue until the carbon concentration of the austenite reaches the T0 curve. So the plates are forming like martensite, but then partitioning carbon into the austenite. So the reaction stops much before the equilibrium composition is reached. So by measuring the composition of the austenite at the point where the reaction stops, we can decide on the role of carbon during transformation. And if you look at this uh, diagram of experimental results, you will see that the reaction stops at the T0 curve, which is far away from the A3 curve. And therefore, we can conclude that the formation of acicular ferrite is diffusionless, but shortly afterwards, the carbon partitions into the remaining austenite. Now, <clears throat> I pointed out to you the role of the austenite grain boundary. It's very important uh, because there's a competition between nucleation at the austenite grain boundaries and inside the austenite grains on non-metallic inclusions. If uh, nucleation occurs too rapidly from the austenite grain boundaries, then you will get very little acicular ferrite because nucleation on inclusions is less favorable than nucleation on the austenite grain boundaries. So suppose we cover the austenite grain boundaries with a layer of allotriomorphic ferrite. Okay? So in effect we destroy the austenite grain boundaries as nucleation sites. Then we will promote acicular ferrite because you can't actually nucleate the plates on the austenite grain boundaries. And here you can see this. Uh, this is a layer of allotriomorphic ferrite on the austenite grain boundaries and because the plates cannot anymore nucleate on the austenite grain boundaries we get intragranular nucleation on inclusions. And a more spectacular example is in this slide where we have introduced a very thin layer of allotriomorphic ferrite at the austenite grain boundaries and we have copious uh, precipitation of acicular ferrite inside the austenite grains. So this is basically a reflection of competition between austenite grain surfaces and intragranular nucleation sites. Okay, so to summarize, uh, acicular ferrite is actually no different from bainite except that it nucleates heterogeneously on inclusions and therefore gives a microstructure in which the plates seem to point in many different directions. Whereas bainite, which starts from the austenite grain boundaries, forms as parallel plates. Now the mechanism of the bainite transformation is that the plates form without any diffusion, the carbon then partitions into the austenite and precipitates as carbides. Uh, in the case of well metals, this reaction of carbide precipitation uh, will only produce a little bit of cementite because well metals generally have a low carbon concentration of the order of 0.05 weight percent. Uh, if we have a um, high carbon concentration, 
then the escape of the carbon from the plate is slower and therefore there's an opportunity to precipitate cementite inside the plates of ferrite and we generate what's classically known as the lower bainite microstructure. And you know, this is extremely well established. So if we argue that acicular ferrite is the same as bainite except for the nucleation event, then we ought to be able to discover lower acicular ferrite and upper acicular ferrite. Upper acicular ferrite is what's normally observed. That means the plates of ferrite do not contain cementite particles. Uh, lower acicular ferrite is not observed because the carbon concentrations of well metals are really quite small. So we deliberately increase the carbon concentration to 0.4 weight percent. Uh, our calculations indicated that that would give rise to lower acicular ferrite. And of course the mechanical properties are hopeless, but that wasn't the goal of the experiment. And sure enough, when we did that, you know, we obtained our acicular ferrite microstructure and transmission electron microscopy shows precipitation of cementite inside the, these plates of acicular ferrite. In other words, we have produced lower acicular ferrite. So everything fits with the proposed mechanism of transformation. Now, you have to be careful because, in general, uh, acicular ferrite is produced by continuous cooling transformation, so other phases can form at higher temperatures. And if they form rapidly, then there won't be much austenite left over for acicular ferrite to form. So that's illustrated here. When we have, say, for example, a low manganese concentration or a low carbon concentration, a lot of amorphic ferrite forms rapidly. Wiedmann ferrite plates can grow right across the grain before acicular ferrite can nucleate on non-metallic particles. Uh, by adjusting the alloy concentration, you can reduce the rate at which the higher temperature transformations occur, and therefore there is a greater opportunity to form acicular ferrite inside the grains of austenite. Now, all this is expressed in mathematical models and you can find um, details in this reference but here is an example of uh, calculations of the allotriomorphic ferrite, Wiedmann-Stern ferrite and acicular ferrite. Obviously you get more acicular ferrite as you retard the growth rate of alpha and alpha W because there's more austenite left untransformed to form acicular ferrite at a lower temperature. Now, I've explained to you uh, uh, some of the aspects of the acicular ferrite transformation, but there is a lot more detail that you can find in the books that I illustrated in the first slide and also on the website that was listed on that uh, first slide. Obviously, uh, the subject is uh, well established for well deposits, uh, but some years ago, um, Nippon Steel actually started to introduce non-metallic particles into steel plates to stimulate acicular ferrite in the heat affected zone of a weld. And the difficulty is that you have to have extremely good control on the size of your inclusions so that they themselves don't act as nucleation sites for fracture. So that particular concept hasn't taken off uh, very well uh, in, in practice. So I'm going to stop my presentation now, uh, but thank you all for listening and I'll be happy to receive questions by my email, uh, which is hkdb at cam.ac.uk. Thank you and goodbye.